Welcome back to Truth to Tell. I'm Andy Driscoll. Michelle is away today. This week we want to update listeners and viewers out there uh, on the status of autism. It's perhaps uh, mysteriously increasing prevalence in Minnesota uh, and everywhere else. Uh, how it's identified, diagnosed, and why, according to a Star Tribune article, most low-income children are being denied Medicaid help for proven autism treatment, while the parents of other wealthier children have navigated the Medicaid reimbursement system to secure tens of thousands of dollars a year for the same treatments, labeled Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. Um, that's merely one type of treatment. Others find themselves competing with alternative programs for health care reimbursement, to no avail, according to one of our guests, and we want to talk. We also want to talk about public responses to this rather suddenly more visible disorder. This issue of vaccination-driven causes of autism been dispensed with uh, or not? Um, Sherry, why don't you kick into that one first? Um, you know, I think this is a tough. Um, simply from the standpoint that our organization spends very little time on the cause and the cure simply because we are extremely busy supporting families with diagnosis and trying to navigate and get the right resources for their particular child. However, um, it is a conversation that continually comes up and as we service the community with workshops and a state conference along with um, symposiums and other efforts, we bring in speakers, scientists, researchers, and the number one topic they bring up is genetics. Um, and that seems to have the common theme to the prevalence rate. And we kind of leave it up to them to help us understand that it has been around, will continue to be around, and it is a lifelong journey. Increase in cancer, burgeoning increase in Alzheimer's disease, burgeoning increases in autism, uh, we're suddenly uh, confronted with, I don't know if it's over-diagnosis or under-diagnosis of, of uh, chemically, or, uh, chemically imbalanced brains that are uh, giving bipolar, children, you know, bringing bipolarism to children. I, I just coined a word, I think. Uh, but, you know, talk about who's doing the research on these chemicals and is anybody going to stop it? Jump in, somebody. Um, I do. <laughs> Hi there. Um, well, first of all, let me address for a minute about the the genetics and the environment. And there is, you know, the saying that if you met one person with autism, then you met one person with autism because it is so spectrum. It is so different. No two children have it the same. Right. It is the symptoms are so ever subtly so different. <coughs> so that makes it very difficult for researchers to to study because you want to have a common denominator for whereas cancer, diabetes, what have you, there is at least some sort of a common denominator for those patients. Now, is it genetic um, for Somalis? If it was, it would have been in Somalia. I would have thought. So do we have some genes that are perhaps more susceptible to the environment that we came here abroad to Minnesota particularly and Sweden? I think so. Um, do we know what that environment is? Certainly not. Um, and, uh, and that's where the researchers come in. And I think there <coughs> just really isn't um, enough researchers in Minnesota to do this. They they have not yet taken up this, and this is a. Is this something that is this something that they should be doing, Sherry? Uh, uh, yeah. Anne, jump in here, Anne. Uh, <laughs> this is certainly something that all, I would think not not only all states, but the National Institutes of Health, mm -hmm. uh, the CDC. Shouldn't they be partnering and spending a hell of a lot of money on this stuff? Yes. Ann Harrington. <laughs> well, um, yes. I, I, I also am. Um, I'm not a researcher. Right. I, I've been a provider for years, but I've been in a unique position to observe um, some trends and um, looking at pockets of autism, specifically in the Minneapolis area as the in my work in early childhood special education and in assessing um, children that were referred for special education since 1987 and um, been able to observe that there are some unique trends that seem to be 
happening within our community for sure. What are they? Well, um, I, it still stands out in my mind that in 1987, back when we were not identifying children as being on the autism spectrum for school purposes. They were, e they were either autistic <coughs> or they weren't, right? Well, for, for special education, <coughs> children receive special education under a broad label of developmental delay. Developmental so, delay, okay. And it's only in um, <coughs> more recent... Were those the days we were still saying retarded? Well, um, I think we were moving away from that, but that was, that okay. was the category <coughs> that children were able to enter into the system. So we were not identifying specifically autism spectrum disorder. Um, but as someone providing services and working with those children and assessing the children referred for special education, the first child that I saw that had classic Canner's autism was from Ethiopia. And that was in 1987 mm. in the Minneapolis school system. And the second child that I saw that <coughs> clearly had classic autism was from Nigeria. And the third, Liberia. Um, mm. And so that, that stuck in my mind. And um, over the years, we have seen some patterns in the school system about location of children mm -hmm. and where they live in the Minneapolis area. Um, and again, so environmental justice gets into this because many, uh, many of the poorest ch children going to <coughs> and kids of color uh, are, are live around uh, generators of pollution and chemical uh, generation. Well, and interestingly, Andy, one of the things that I saw, <coughs> excuse me, a number of years ago, was a pattern of autism around our lakes and actually in our wealthier communities. There you go. And very specifically um, around Lake Harriet, Lake Calhoun. Um, there's also been speculation that that is, our, our lakes are right under the flight path of the airplanes. You know, there's lots of possi wow. possibilities, but um, I live in a particular neighborhood where um, those of us who have children with autism call it Autism Alley because of such a high um, prevalence of autism within a four block radius. No kidding. There were six children born around the same age, all with autism. They're, um, buildings, now they right? They're buildings that have kids with autism, all Somalis. Put your mic in yes. front of you, uh, Deal. Yeah, sorry. There yes. The, what, yeah, talk about that, Anne. You told me about that. Well, also, um, when say I that again. Oh, there, there are buildings, one or two buildings, that every Somali family that lives there has a kid with autism. Is that place. right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I'm not sure, Andy, you're aware that we have 12,000 families just in the state of Minnesota that are affected by mm -hmm. ASD. Really? Um, 13,000 children have been diagnosed, and many are around the age of eight. Um, those numbers... Um, That's that recent? Is that a recent mm -hmm. number? Yes, and that data is what's pushing more and more many of us to come together, link arms, have a stronger voice, pushing for research. Um, IDLE and I are in a state task force, and much of what we're pushing for is to go after federal funding. Otherwise, we're doing it locally, and what we really want to go after is push the federal government um, and be included in a lot of research. With that comes findings. With mm -hmm. that comes more interventions. With that comes funding for our families. But today, it's really about making sure that you have data to push many to take action. I've called it a disorder. Um, is it a disorder? Uh, maybe not. Some people think they're gifted if they have it. Um, and perhaps these are older people with uh, something less, uh, high, more high functioning along the autism uh, spectrum than uh, some children uh, find themselves. And have you decided, uh, what, what about that? What, what about that description? Are they gifted or disordered? Well, I mean, I don't. It, it is high. Um, it, because it's so spectrum, and I, I think people who have the Asperger side of autism or the high functioning side of autism. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I don't blame them. They, they, they are fine the way they are. They might need some support services, maybe with social or maybe with, you know, just a little bit support everyday living. 
but if you have it on the severe side or if you have <laughs> it where it's hitting us where it's making our children nonverbal non we have the yeah. classic autism and you know Somalis are known to be a nation of poets we're the Irish of Africa so it's silencing children from a community that is extremely oral we are not on that side we want to know what the cause is we want to know what a cure is we want to have a way to prevent it and because then you know, I understand the other side, but then I, I'm hoping they also understand our side. Why we all live in this autism world, it is so different, and we need to respect each co child's ability, strength, and you know weaknesses, and try to figure out how to make them cope and live better and achieve their own goal lives. You know, lives and goals. Uh, among your uh, tens of thousands, uh, uh, Sherry. Uh, how are they describing themselves? Uh, is there, and how do you know where s some child falls along the spectrum? Yeah, it's a good question, Andy. Part of, um, when you think about autism spectrum disorder, um, we emphasize the word spectrum. Um, autism is a confusing word. In many languages, there is no word t or meaning. Um, disorder has a negative connotation to it and so well we, of course we tend to um, really focus in on spectrum as the key word in this particular um, need and part of um, our families really if you if you look at the spectrum then you're really looking at the individual and part of the reason that's so important is because then you can look at that child or you can look at adults and really understand what are their needs and what are their interventions. And part of this is really going after providing resources that meet what they need in order to adapt into our world. How did we start treating children with autism once we identified the man? Um, well, years ago, Ivar Suzanne Lovas. Suzanne Harrington, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, Ivar Lovas developed um, a program and did some research on um, children with autism and using the applied behavior analysis approach which is um, teaching discrete skills and using reinforcers um, to help promote um, the use of those skills and that's been kind of considered the gold standard of treatment for um, many many years and still is today part in part because the research had a control group um, one of the criticisms of some of the other uh, treatment approaches is that there hasn't been enough evidence to support them. However, the National Research Council in their book, Educating Children with Autism, identified what are the key um, components of best practice in treatment. And what they determined was that it was not so much which treatment modality was used, whether applied behavior analysis or the DIR floor time model, which I am um, trained in and have been trying to bring here to Minnesota for many years, um, or RDI, which is another treatment um, methodology, that it wasn't so much which treatment approach, um, but that it be individualized for each child. And as we've been talking about, each child is unique, um, and therefore it needs to be specifically directed to that child's needs. You build relationships with this floor time DIR thing versus uh, the, the, B, the <laughs> skills <laughs> development of LOVAS. Am I right about this? The, no, you're right, yeah. All yes. right, and talk about what you mean by that. And, and Sherry, go ahead, jump in if you want to. All right, and how about you? Go ahead. Well, um, DIR stands for Developmental <coughs> individualized and relationship-based intervention. I can see why they say DIR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, floor time is really the how you implement it. Um, but it is a developmental approach that really looks at promoting each child's development um, rather than teaching specific skills in isolation. It's more um, teaching children how to um, learn to navigate the social environment. And it also um, addresses some of those individual differences, such as the sensory processing piece, which is often very challenging for children on the autism spectrum, regardless of where they fall. Sensory processing issues are often very much 
um, a challenge. And so um, developmental approaches take a typical development mm -hmm. um, model and support children up that developmental ladder. Most good intervention programs have some kind of behavioral component, developmental component, a social component, and address the various areas as Anne has talked about. But when it, what it really gets down to is this single subject research. You're sitting down with a parent and you're looking at what would you like um, uh, to change, what would make life easier for this child and for this family, and let's implement this intervention, and then let's reevaluate it. How would it look different in three months? And if it's not looking different, let's craft our interventions. Let's uh, look at adding somebody to the team. So this is a, a work in progress, really, that uh, between the school system, between community agencies, uh, between parents, this large team that's advocating for the child um, and with the parents making decisions about what intervention is working and how things are changing. Is mainstreaming an autistic child in regular classrooms as opposed to special ed helpful? Um, well, mainstreaming helps if the kid is ready because often these children have sensory processing disorder so they're not able to tolerate, like for example, all the people here you know, my son would have held his ears and uh, closed his eyes. And so to mainstream them slowly so that they can be members, you know, productive members of society, that's important. Um, and just to kind of touch, we don't have a lot of time, who pays for it? Yeah, it, get the pay let's get the payments let's, down and why the public <laughs> isn't paying for the poor people. Um, yeah, well, you know, that sucks. I, we can ask Lucinda Jensen, right? We can ask her why. What happens is that when you, ha when you have medical, when you're low income and you have Medicaid or medical assistance, you are automatically put, you do have the option, but nobody ever tells you, you are automatically put into prepaid medical assistance or PMAP. So then that comes in under managed care. So you've got health partners, blue, you know, you care, what have you. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're wealthy, you put in the TEFRA. Medicaid, it's still Medicaid, and that pays for early intervention therapy such as ADA. Why does why why does that happen, Sherry? How do you guys lobby for for more of the poor folks to get into? Well, I think I think the correlation is just becoming clear to us that there is mm -hmm. a major major issue, and yes. really, it's our jobs um, at the Autism Society of Minnesota to really go down and educate. It's no different than educating a parent to make sure that they're pushing for the right things for their child, we have to go down and educate our legislation and really start to push for stronger laws mm -hmm. as well as um, those that are in our insurance companies and helping mm -hmm. them understand the importance of I see a lot of nodding heads yeah. in the room yeah. here, yeah. so right. because everybody agrees. Because yeah. don't pay either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you get paid by the public and Harrington? Um, I have uh, been down at the state um, capital lobbying for insurance to cover all treatment of children with autism and to make that available right. for all children mm -hmm. and all families. And there is a discrepancy between um, the services that are offered to children through medical assistance. The reimbursement is less. Mm -hmm. And as my friend Idle has said, um, there isn't as much incentive even mm -hmm. to provide services to children if your reimbursement is less. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can't thank you all enough. We have to cut this off. We're already <laughs> running over here. I, you know, we're probably going to have to come back and talk about this again, don't you think? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, thank you very much for joining us by telephone from Fraser. She's a clinical psychologist. Thanks thank for being you. with us. Thank you. All right. Thank uh, you so much. And for Sherry. Us. Yeah, Idol and Ann Harrington. We'll uh, see you next week. Uh, remember that we'll have TRE talking. Uh, till then, please do take care of each other. <laughs>